Well, welcome everyone. Um, today we'll talk about a simple approach to fixing uh, a marrow leak. But first, I'd like you to think of a little situation for me. So let's say you're a developer working on Rails, and one morning you notice one of your app processes crashing because the memory is going too high. And here's the brief. You don't know when it started, your application monitoring tools do not help, and you have literally dozens of files that could be responsible for this. My name is Vincent Rolea, and welcome to my life. So a few words about myself. I come from a town in France which is called Roubaix. If you like cycling, you might have heard of it because there's a famous race that's called Paris-Roubaix, which basically goes from Paris to Roubaix. Uh, I'm a senior product developer at Podia, and I have the luck to be married to the wonderful Aurel, without whom I wouldn't be here today, as she's been really supportive and pushing for me to apply to the to Aurel's talk. So you can, you can see a picture of us um, near the cliffs of Dover in England. Uh, you can see it was a sunny day back then, so it's rare enough to be mentioned uh, in England. Uh, you can find me on the bird side at Vincent Rolia. You can find me on the elephant side at Vincent on ruby.social and on the octopus side at Virolia. Uh, and yes, that's a lot of animals. A few words about Podia. Um, so we like to think Podia of Podia as a one-stop shop where you, can, where you can find everything you need to sell courses, webinars, downloads, and community. I'd like to extend a warm thanks to uh, the Podia team for allowing me to be here, and especially our CTO, Jamie, and uh, all the developers, some of whom are in the, the room today, uh, who's been really helpful uh, and whose feedback has been instrumental to getting this presentation together. I'm really happy to be in Atlanta today. Um, well, I nearly didn't make it as the morning I was supposed to fly in, my flight got canceled. Uh, I got a nice text from Delta saying, yay, well, your flight's canceled, and we don't have any replacement flights, so yeah, that was a bit of a problem, but I eventually made it, and I'm really happy. I'd like to thank Ruby Central for organizing the conference and allowing me to talk to you today. Speaking of which, um, what this talk's not about? Well, first, this talk is not about you regretting me that I eventually made it to Atlanta. But also, even though the talk is about memory management, it's not a talk about how Ruby manages memory or how Ruby handles memory. If you're interested on the subject, I cannot recommend enough whatever Nate Bear speaks or talks about on the subject. So what is it about? Well, this talk is about methodology. It's about how to taking a complex problem and breaking it into an easy one. It's about taking a step back rather than diving in. So of course, you'll see Ruby code in this presentation, and yes, the problem is about memory here. However, the, the techniques are present here could be applied to other languages and even other fields and disciplines. So without further ado, let's talk about the ticket. So you remember our little thought experiment at the beginning of the presentation? Well, it turns out it really happened to us a few months back. So every few weeks, developers at Podia enter what we call our support dev rotation. So during a week, a pair of developers dedicates their time to fixing bugs that are logged by our awesome custom of team, but also working on technical improvement, such as technical debt, refactorings, and all kinds of updates, such as performance ones. And during my support dev week, uh, one particular ticket caught my attention. So this ticket was written by our CTO, Jamie. Uh, it was about one of our background worker memory going above the one gigabyte limit that was allowed. Um, Jamie said that he noticed that we got a sad kick shutdown error and um, our worker was exceeding its memory limit. And since the memory was continuing to grow, he was suspecting that we could have a memory leak here. Um, attached with the, the ticket was this graph. Uh, so this is a graph from uh, Heroku metrics and at the bottom you can see the me average memory the worker was using over time and at the top you can see the event timeline. Uh, on the bottom graph, we can see a few features that are of interest to us. The first one is the one you can see in the red rectangles. Here we can see sudden spikes in memory. Um, these are usually the result of a, a lot of instantiated objects in the, in the job uh, we are executing on the worker. We call that usually memory bloat. 
The other one is the behavior you can find inside the blue rectangle, which is the slow growth in memory Jamie was referring, referred, referring to in the ticket. And this is the one that caught our attention because that memory growth eventually led to crashes in the worker. So this ticket caught my eye since memory problems are often mistaken for memory leaks. So is this a real memory leak? To find this out, let's look at our background infrastructure at Podia and how it works. At Podia, we use Sidekick for our background processing need. We split our async loan between three different type of workers. Each serves one or multiple Sidekick queues, and we try to dispatch our jobs uh, in the appropriate worker based on the expected execution time. So for instance, jobs that are expected to uh, complete in less than a minute are sent to our one minute worker. Similarly, jobs that are expected to take less than five minutes to execute are sent to our five minutes worker, and the biggest one are sent to our hour worker. This has a few benefits. The first one is that we can set different latency expectation for uh, our different worker types, which means that if uh, the latency on our one minute workers starts to get above a minute 30, we'll get alerted uh, that there's a problem over there. Also, we can scale each class independently. So let's say we have a big job that needs to complete and a big migra migration to perform. We could send this to our one hour worker and maybe scale it both vertically and horizontally so we wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't take too much time. Unfortunately for us, the problem in the ticket was happening on our one minute worker, the one that needs the lowest latency possible. <clears throat> so do you remember the graph? Or, um, so here is the, the, here's the, how it's set up. So the one minute worker is a standard 2x dyno with one gigabyte of RAM on Heroku. It serves our default and mail queues, which, which are amongst the biggest one at Podia. And it has a concurrency set to 25. So just as a reminder, this is the sidekick concurrency, which is basically the number of threads that are started for each worker, which each one minute worker. So the, do you remember our graph from earlier? Uh, we are trying to find out if the behavior we are seeing in the blue rectangles is the result of a memory leak. So we are wondering, is there any configuration changes we could make on our worker uh, so we can make sure of it? Well, it turns out there is. The first one is the obvious one. We could scale our worker vertically, which means throwing more RAM at it. And that's what we did. So we scaled our worker from one gigabytes of RAM to 2.5 gigabytes of RAM. And here's the, here's the result. So here it's less clear than our previous graph because the time scale is greater, but we can see that the memory is still overshooting its limits. So consuming more than 2.5 what it was using before. So scaling vertically did not work. Maybe we can update another setting. We saw that our workers serve two queues, some of the biggest one in our app, the default and mail queues. So maybe we could split the load between two different workers and we would, in, as a result, decrease our memory footprint. So we did, we split this into two distinct workers, one serving our mail queue and the other one serving our default queue. And this was the result. At the top, you can see our, one, our new one minute mail worker and the, at the bottom, our new one minute default worker. So we can see that our one minute mail worker is performing fine. The memory is eventually plateauing, which is what we are looking for. However, our one minute default worker continued to grow and this is not on the graph here, but it will eventually overshoot the limit and crash. So we start to really think we are in the presence of a real memory leak here. But is there one last thing we could do to make sure of it? And yes, it's to, it's to, to touch at the concurrency of the worker. Um, 25 is a pretty high concurrency to, to set on a worker. Actually, a few months back, Sidekick lowered its default concurrency level from 25 to 10. So even though we, we were kind of sure we had a problem, we, we were like, yeah, it's just an environment variable to change, so it was worth testing it. So we lowered the concurrency from 25 to 15. But we were still featuring the same memory growth on our worker. So let's sum up. We got the ticket raising a question. Is there a memory leak in, our, in one of our Ruby job? And at this point, we are quite convinced there is. We lowered the concurrency, we split the workers, and we increased their capacity with no satisfactory result. So now here's a question for you. Is this worth fixing? I mean, it's to talk about pragmatism, so let's be pragmatic here. Is this worth fixing? Because like, since the worker will be crashing, putting the jobs back into its queue, the, job, the worker will restart, take back the, the jobs to perform, and it will simply work, right? 
Well, we expect our app to grow over time, and as a result, it will likely happen more. And as the worker will crush more often, it will take more time to restart, and our latency will increase over time, which is not what we want. As, as you remember, this is our one-minute worker. So yes, we need to fix this. And to do so, we need to find the source of our leak. So it's time for us to reach out. So when facing a complex situation, I often, I often wonder how I could leverage all my years of professional experience to find a solution. And this time was no different. I made a Google search. <laughs> Senior, right? Uh, well, it <laughs> well, it always starts with a Google search. Or does it? Uh, maybe not anymore, but well, we really did, we really did a Google search uh, as, yeah, ChatGPT wasn't around yet. So we did our research, and actually the search, the, our research surfaced three solutions to solve our memory problem. It turns out when it comes to memory, this is the three main things that we can find out there. The first one being to use Rust. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Internet, but uh, no thanks. Uh, the second one is to use your application performance monitoring tools. Uh, tools such as, such as AppSignal, Heroku, Scout, Neuralink, Datadog. Um, at Podia, we use AppSignal, and we are pretty happy about it. Um, it re it's really a nice tool because it allows you to plot graphs such as this one. So you can see here, this is the average memory uh, usage of our one-minute worker. So this graph was plotted a few weeks ago, so spoiler alert, you can see that we fixed the issue. Um, so it's a, those kind of graphs are great because they allow you to link specific behavior to a specific point in time. More, more importantly, we could link this to um, a specific commit or deploy. It won't pinpoint the exact location of the leaking code, but however, you'd like a handful, only a handful of files from a commit or deploy to look at. The problem is, in our case, we had no idea when the problem started. We deploy our app five to 10 times a day, and the worker did not have time to exceed its memory before it was restarted. So there's no way we can go back in time to find the source of the leak. Um, so we have to turn to our third option here, which is to use dedicated tooling. Um, so you probably have heard of tools such as Memory Profiler or Derail Benchmark. Um, those tools usually work that way. So you wrap the code you want to instrument in a reporting block and print the report, which will give you all sorts of information about the objects that are allocated and objects that are retained in memory. So let's take this example that's using memory profiler. So this is a pretty easy example. We have an array, and then in the block, we just add a thousand times the hello search string to the array, and then we print the report. Um, these are extremely powerful tools and because they, they, they'll be able to pinpoint the exact location of where the memory was retained, where the objects were allocated, and so on. And it looks promising to fix our issue. But in order to take advantage of this, you need to know one thing. It's where to instrument. So if we look back at our example, it, this, this looks pretty easy. But the code in the example is pretty easy. We know where to instrument because we have a sense of where the problem would be. But there's a great deal of chance that you're working on way more complex apps that, that, than that. And in our case, we don't know precisely where to instrument. So we'd have to basically instrument all the jobs in our default queue. So let's try to see how many jobs we need to instrument then. <clears throat> so, well, to do that, we'll need to look at our jobs in our jobs folder. Um, so here we are assuming that the faulty code is in our application code, not our third party code. Um, we are keeping a pretty updated gem file, so we, we reckon this, the problem was on us. So we are looking for jobs that are enqueued in the default queue. And in order to do that, we need to be able to get those uh, class for those jobs. So first, let's get all the files in our jobs folder. We are assuming that the faulty code is on our application code, as I said. So once we've got those files, we want to get the jobs that are enqueued in our default queue. So to do, to do that, there's a method uh, we can call on our job, which is uh, QName. But to do that, we need the class of the jobs. So from our file pass, we do some string manipulations, like removing the file extension, splitting, or, splitting around forward slashes to get the namespace, and then camelizing and constatizing the classes using active support inflector. And once we've done that, uh, it's just a matter of checking if the QName for the job is the default QName. Here you can see that we check if the job class has a queue name it, re it responds to. It's an edge case for jobs that do not iterate from application job. 
we have a handful of, of those, and luckily for us, they are all included in the default queue. So now let's look at the size of our jobs uh, queued as default array. It turns out we have a, 120 jobs uh, in that folder that are queued into the default queue. And so, we, and so we need to instrument those 120 files, having each their own set of arguments and context required. So we, we, we are wondering, isn't there a better way? Um, it's, it's time to be really pragmatic here. So I'm a, product, I'm a product developer, which means my primary focus should be on product and no low-level problems, such as instrumenting and analyzing memory reports for 120 jobs. A project deadline could be nearing, a colleague could need my help on something, or a big feature I've been working on needs to be launched. Here's a say I like a lot. If you do not like how the table is set, turn around the table. So it was time for us to look at the problem from a different angle. So how did we do it? Well, we, we started to think, what's the real problem we want to fix here? Uh, do I want to know precisely what's causing the issue? No, honestly, I don't care. I don't need fancy instrumentation right now. All I need to do, all I need to know is to find a job causing the, this mess. And it turns out the solution was right in front of our noses from the beginning. Do you recall when we split our workers and each one serving a different queue, our Miller and Delphi queue? Well, if we look at those graphs, what do they tell us? Do you have any idea? Well, they tell us that the problem is not here. They tell us the problem is here. Because when we did that, we safely steered our whole mailer queue because our mailer worker is safe. So now let's take a step back and think, could, couldn't we do the same with the now one minute default worker? What if I could take some jobs from there and park them in a specific queue to see how they behave? This is when the quarantine queue comes in play. So what's our thinking behind it? Let's consider the following, the following setup with one default queue that serves four jobs and the quarantine queue that serves none. Each of those queues are run in their own worker. Our default queue is leaking memory, so it's in a, in a red state. Now, let's move half the job from the quarantine queue, uh, from the default queue and move them into the quarantine queue. And, look, and let's look at what's happening. Well, it turns out the default queue is leaking, but the quarantine queue is safe, which means that our job one and two are safe, but our job three and four are the suspect jobs. Now, now that job one and two are safe, let's put them back into the default queue and let's move half the remaining job into the quarantine queue, which is in that case job three. Uh, turns out the default queue is now safe, but the quarantine queue is leaking memory, which means that our third job is leaking memory and our fourth job is fine. So now some of you will start to think, I know this technique, this rings a bell. And you're right, this is plain old binary search. <laughs> this, is what, uh, this is what tools such as Git Bisect use. And why is it interesting in our case? Well, binary search has what we call, what we call a logarithmic complexity, which is like what you see on the green line, which means that it follows the trend described by the green line and instrumenting each job each job would be like around the red line, which is an order complexity. Why does it matter? Well, for a given data set size, which is the number of suspect jobs in our cases, binary search will require less tries to find a leaking job. But also, for bigger data set, the binary search will require not that much more many tries to get the leaking job, which is good since we have a pretty large data set. So that's the theory behind it. So that, that's pretty cool, we're pretty happy about it, but now how, how can we implement this into practice? Um, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to achieve. From the theory, we want to dynamically put specific jobs into quarantine to then have a few tries and look at our leaking jobs. So as a reminder, this is how the active job API works. This is how you set a default, uh, this is how you, you set the default queue on a job, for instance. So I don't want to be changing the queue name manually, then make a commit each time I want to put jobs into quarantine. This would take way too much time. What we want is more in the likes of this. So our goal is to intercept jobs on their way to Redis to assign a queue dynamically, which means that we need to intercept the jobs between the moment the sidekick client enqueues them and the moment they, are, they end up in Redis where the sidekick server will be processing them. And luckily for us, Sidekick has a built-in system to do this. It's called Sidekick Client Middlewares. 
So how does it work? A sidekick middleware is basically a class that responds to call. When the sidekick client enqueues a job, it will pass the following argument down the middleware start, stack, the worker class, the job, the queue, and the Redis pool. The middleware will do whatever processing it needs, like logging or charging, changing the job queue in our case, before yielding to the next middleware in the stack, which will be called with the same arguments. So all we have to do is to get the job that is enqueued, look if we need to put it into quarantine, and if so, update its queue. So first, let's get the job. Sidekick will, in some, case, in some cases, wrap the job, which is why we check for the wrapped key here. So now that we have the job class name, we need to know if we need to put, the, put it into quarantine. To do that, we set the jobs we want to quarantine as a semicolon separated list in an environment variable. We probably could have done better here, like using Redis keys to set the jobs we want to set into quarantine. But this was a quick and dirty way we liked as it would allow us to test quickly our implementation. Now that we have our job class and our list of quarantine jobs, we can check if we need to quarantine the job being enqueued. And it's as simple as that. So we just check if the job class it's, is in the quarantine jobs list. And if so, we just assign it the quarantine queue. So that's pretty, and that's it. Um, what's remaining to do is to add the new middleware class to the middleware chain in the sidekick configuration file. And lastly, we need to update our proc file so it can start a new worker that will serve only the quarantine queue, which is done here. After a few batch, we ended up with a batch of seven to eight, seven, eight jobs in the quarantine queue. But it turns out when we looked at the logs, only one of those was uh, invoked. The other one uh, were rarer jobs that we only uh, started a few times. Uh, a few times. So it, there it was, our leaking job. It was leaking like a champion. <laughs> our send segment avenger. Our send segment avenger. So th this job only rule it is to send analytics event to anal our analytics service. So how does it look like? Well, it's a real simple one, actually. You can see that the, it does two main things. The first one is to parse arguments and to do some manipulation on it. The second one is that we instantiate a new analytics object and we call track on it. I'd like to stress this part. Every time the job is executed, we instantiate a new segment analytics object and call track on it. So how did we fix it? Well, it's simple, we just remove the job. <laughs> we don't need analytics, right? But actually the solution is even simpler than that. It's, it's just like read the docs. And when you look at the analytics gem docs, it's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. The doc advocates to instantiate the analytics object only once and set it as a global variable, variable in an initializer. So that's what we did. We just add a segment initializer, um, instantiate the analytics object once, set it as Podia, the Podia segment global object, and then every time we need to call track, uh, only every time we need to track an event, we just call track on that Podia segment object. And voila, this is how we fix the problem without having a single clue about what was happening. Isn't it? That's neat, right? But I feel like some of you are a bit disappointed, like you feel maybe even wrong, like you came here and you don't even have an answer for this. But don't worry. Uh, it turns out now that we fixed the issue, we have some time to investigate it and try to understand what was happening. So do you remember the tools I presented to you earlier during the presentation? Well, now, now that we know where to instrument, we can use them, and that's pretty cool. So here's our job before we fixed it. So again, we are instantiating the analytics library in an object and calling track on it. Um, so we are pretty sure our arguments parsing is not responsible for the problem. So what we are really interested in is the last two commands, which is the instantiation of the object and the call of track on it. So let's instrument that block. So we, as we saw earlier, we call memory profiler.report, pass the code we want to instrument in as a block, and then we print the report. And there, there's the result. So um, the report is actually way longer than that, but I only have extracted the retained memory by location at the bottom and by class at the top, at, as they are the most meaningful information we can get in the report. So what can we see here? 
first we can see that the code we wrapped in the report block retains objects related to the analytics library. Secondly, we see that the line in the code retaining the most memory is the line 182 of the client file. So to recap, every time we instantiate a call track on our analytics client, memory is retained. And since we are a really successful app with plenty of users, it happens quite a lot of time. So a lot of analytics jobs are enqueued and memory is retained after each job execution, leading to the memory leak we just saw before. Bingo. So now let's look at the client file to understand more about it. So this is the, uh, an extract of the uh, an segment analytics client Ruby file. So this is our client code. And this is the line that's retain the, retaining the most memory in the code. So here's how the client, uh, the client class works in a nutshell. Tracking events are actually enqueued and processed asynchronously in a different worker thread. And this is, uh, <clears throat> so after a track method call, what actually happens is that a new client uh, object is instantiated and the action we want to track is appended to the queue. And then we make sure that the worker is running. So I won't go into too much details about thread, sa thread safety and how mutex synchronization works here. But here's what the ensure worker running does. If there's no running worker, it's starting in a new thread. But here's the thing. The worker is starting in the block passed to thread new and assigned to the worker thread instance variable. So you probably know that Ruby blocks keep reference to their current context bindings, which here are the, the client class that's instantiated, but also all the method in instant variable around it. So client has a reference to the worker thread that is created within the block that has a reference to the client. So the client would basically never be garbage batch collected as the thread holds a reference to it, which is why the client is, is retaining memory as well as all other objects that the client refers to that we saw in the memory report. And this is why instantiating the library only once in an initializer, in an initializer fixed the issue. Whew. Imagine having to get into the bottom of this in the first place. Uh, I don't know about you, but I do prefer my little binary search in that, in that specific case. So that was the story of how we fixed a complex problem we had using a technique as simple as binary search. So my biggest hope is that this case study will help some of you next time not feel overwhelmed with a complex issue that seemed hard to fix. Taking a look to a problem from a different angle can often uncover solutions that are quick and easy to implement. And this is the main takeaway I wanted to convey here today. So thanks so much for listening to me. If you have any questions, I'm available. And feel free to come join me and have a chat with me. Have a great day.